Let's turn to look at the topic of not black magic, practical tips for statutory interpretation. How to avoid being overwhelmed by complexity. So this is the second of our five-part lecture series. So in outline, I want to deal with a different problem uh, of preemptive tree clearing at a site up in Caloundra called Pelican Links. And I want to take the perspective of the local government and ask, can council stop preemptive tree clearing at the site? And then we're going to go back to that question that we had of the core question, I think, that really arises as a generic issue is, does the proposed development comply with the law? And if not, what steps need to be taken to either stop it or make it comply? And that's what drives you into generally the development assessment system because if it's accessible development in some way then you need an approval and so how do you get there I also want to just mention at the end um, the recent decision in Fairmount Group and Moreton Bay Regional Council which was just decided recently caused a bit of a kerfuffle uh, and essentially has confirmed that local governments can regulate vegetation management issues even if at a state government level the state government doesn't have an interest in it and it's category X um, or shown as white on vegetation mapping. Okay, so the Pelican Links golf course uh, up at Caloundra, we know where Caloundra is. Uh, nice drive north past um, Bribe Island. So Caloundra, if you go in from the highway, drive into Caloundra, you actually have to drive into Caloundra and then drive south. Uh, the South of Caloundra for the last few decades there's been canal estates developed and Pelican Links, uh, so they were all wetland areas at the top of Palmerstone Passage originally and over the last few decades canal estates have been built and from a developer's perspective you know you can buy, <coughs> canal estates are uh, historically been quite popular because uh, you take land that you can buy very cheaply because no one wants it, it's low lying and you know subject to flooding and those sorts of things. Uh, you Historically, it was relatively easy to get approval to um, do it. And then by building the canals, not only do you increase the value of the land in that people love access, you know, looking out over the water and able to tie up their boat, something like that, particularly in a beautiful area like um, Palmerstone Passage, but also you get cheap fill to raise, so you dig out the canals and you take the mud that you pull out of the ground as long as you deal with acid sulfate soil issues, you end up with all this fill that you can then raise up the surrounding land. So it's sort of like a win-win situation. You get water, increase the value of the land, and you fill the surrounding blocks so that they don't flood. And anyway, for the last few decades, the state government has tried to clamp down on canal estates because they're so um, damaging to critical ecosystems like mangroves and wetlands that are really important for not only biodiversity but fisheries resources and those sorts of things. And Palmerstone Passage is a very important fisheries resource. So the local government uh, for the last few decades has been trying to stop further development south. So that um, creek that's there, um, I think it's Bell Creek, I can't remember the Bell's name of it. Bell's, 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 Bell's Creek. Creek. Yeah, that little creek there. Basically, the council has been trying to pr stop any development south of the creek for a considerable time. And you can see that there's basically farmland south of it. And you can see Palmerstone Passage over there on the right and the historic development um, of the both urban development, the canal estates, but also golf courses. So golf courses, if you're a developer, are often a great way to clear land but also they can be a holding pattern, so that plenty of examples of golf courses that go in to an area and then they clear the area and then lo and behold, 10, 15 years later, the developer says, it's, and they keep them privately owned, they say this golf course is uneconomic, they close the, the restaurant or whatever, it sits derelict and the local community, you know, is, you know, weeds start to grow on the golf course and then the developer says, you know, it's such a shame, this is uneconomic, um, but if we put some houses on, you know, nine of the um, 18 holes, then, you know, we can continue to use the other nine holes and, you know, so they get uh, authorised to develop nine of those holes and then, lo and behold, the other nine holes turn out to be uneconomic five years later and basically it's a great way to clear land and, and as well as when you bring in your initial stages, um, 
you increase the value of the land because people who want to play golf, um, you know, like having overlooking the fairways and those sorts of things. So often they're sort of the thin end of the wedge. Anyway, if we focus in, you can see the, the lakes are really just, as I said, the, the remains of where you take out the sludge. And I say sludge in a very loving way, you know, beautiful wetlands, um, but, um, you know, comes out of the ground, smelly. Um, you use it to fill the surrounding land. You treat it to deal with acid sulfate soils. So the area that was cleared is in that red circle. And this is what was proposed um, at Pelican Links. And what I've done is put um, a Google Earth image beside what was proposed so you can see it. So essentially what the developer was proposing was more houses, um, uh, hotels and the like. It was a, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of development. Um, there's a structure plan, just to give you an idea. So what happened, it's a few years ago, but it's good, I'm using it as an example of statutory interpretation. And it's a really interesting case. So the original approval was granted in 96 for the development of the golf course subject to conditions. There was initial clearing of the site in 97 to 98. Then a new company bought it in 2004, they met with the council officers uh, about develop, you know, the development they wanted to do, and the council said, no, we don't want any development. We want it basically left. We want the vegetation left there. We don't want you to develop it. And the council was assured no clearing would occur um, without council approval. But then, early one morning, council gets a call. Help! They're, they're clearing the site. They're, you know, they're clearing the golf course. Uh, so council races out to the site uh, and they were stopped at the gates by a security guard. Um, this is an extract from some of the litigation. On 21 July, Mr Dean and an environment compliance officer with council received a notification from a member of the public of suspected unlawful tree clearing occurring on the western of the west of Pelican Waters Golf Club. He went to the golf club around 10.30 a.m. where he, when he arrived, he was approached by a NASCAM security officer. He told that person who he was and then he was investigating a complaint of tree clearing. The security officer refused him permission to enter the site and he had to leave. But, and that, I just love this next bit, but <laughs> he then went off to the local airport, chartered a helicopter and overflew the site at 2.15 p.m. and he took photographs of what he saw. Now that's where, you know, there's a cheer from the crowd. Uh, I gave, I was talking with um, compliance staff from Brisbane City Council last week doing some staff training for them and I talked to about this example and uh, they were all laughing because you know the manager was in the room and he said oh he's now going to get all these requests to hire helicopters and um, uh, great initiative from the council officer and really proactive uh, or I suppose it's reactive but great initiative summarise of that. Here's the pictures that he um, took flying over the site. They're a bit blurry, um, but this is what council provided to me. So you can see that lake uh, in the mid-ground and Caloundra in the um, distance, and then the clearing that's occurring is in the foreground. And I'm going to focus in on... So you might be able to see it, but there's some... Um, bulldozers here. In the next photographs you'll see them. So that's looking across the lakes again. There's the bulldozers. Uh, so they're working away. Here's the bulldozers in that section. And <coughs> here's basically they've pulled over the Melalucas. So the site had been previously cleared. So it wasn't of interest, sorry, it was shown as <coughs> essentially white on vegetation mapping. And so the, there wasn't any state government controls um, on it but council didn't want essentially the clearing to go ahead. So here's just some pictures I took um, in 2010 when I was teaching environmental law out at the University of Queensland. Um, I contacted the golf course and the developer had long since moved on and the golf course was happy for me to take a class up there and um, we did a, I always used to assess my courses by the students would prepare a development application for a real site. So the first time I ran the course. I got them to do a development application for that site that didn't involve essentially clearing trees or no, I think they had to work within the area that had been cleared um, just to get them into the 
um, the complexity of the planning schemes. Okay, so that's our problem. We're council. Let's assume the facts are happening now. How can we stop the clearing? That's what we want to do. And then that brings up this question, well, does the proposed development comply with the law? And if not, what steps need to be taken to either stop it or make it comply? And then your question, subsidiary questions are, well, what laws regulate it? And within that embedded is a question, well, how do we interpret it? So has a development offence been committed is really what we'll get to. And if we assume the, the facts occurred this year and to answer that, you need to interpret the Planning Act. Now, if we talk about statutory interpretation, that might give you a skin reaction or you think, oh my gosh, we're not going there. Um, and there's um, plenty of books on statutory interpretation which are long and look complicated. But um, I'm going to try and unpack it for you. And I'd also m you know, make this point that you know, if you're not a lawyer, then interpretation of statutes can seem a bit like black magic. Um, it, answers seem to come from lawyers burning incense and chanting abracadabra. <laughs> um, but, and, sorry, and lawyers can fuel that sort of feeling of mystique and you know, tell you, well, you're not a lawyer, what would you know? And my suggestion to you would be, well, a a either don't use that lawyer or, you know, the, um, you know, go and get better help because lawyers are there to help you if you're a planner or you're a member of the community, whatever, um, and your opinions uh, and knowledge are really valuable and a lawyer that dismisses you really isn't a good lawyer. But it's also just wrong um, to do that because it's not some secret legal business that non-lawyers can't participate in. So there's a whole heap of textbooks on statutory interpretation and they, what the problem I think with them is they tend to focus on a lot of the complex technical rules, which in practice very rarely ever get referred to. Most statutory interpretation is actually really simple. The key issue is finding the law and then navigating a complicated document. But if you can basically follow cross-references within a complicated document and you know, follow the, those links, then you can, do, you can basically work out what's required. So it's not an impenetrable thicket. So complexity is often a misunderstanding, you know, getting lost in the complexity is often a misunderstanding of the simple steps in that answer most of your questions. So the key message that I want to give you is that a central challenge you face in interpreting the law is to navigate in a planning context, is to navigate multiple large overlapping acts, acts and related documents at the same time. And you often need to do this while dealing with multiple levels of government and decision mm -hmm. makers and bridging transitions between old and new laws and related documents, such as old and new planning schemes. And that's typically the central challenge, and that's where a lot of people get lost. But if you can overcome that, then there's really nothing, you know, there's no special skills required beyond just basically taking the time to work through them. So there's some basic um, rules that I've given you on a handout. When I say related documents, it can include a whole range of um, things that hang off acts. So regulations, regional plans, planning schemes, planning scheme policies, development permits, environmental authorities, environmental protection orders, and non-statutory documents. So there's the law, and then often for government, if you're taking enforcement action, you'll have non-statutory documents, policies, that guide the exercise of your discretion. So enforcement policies, for instance, can be really important. So a key bit of information here is that the development approval of the golf course was subject to a condition which said no clearing of native vegetation is to occur on the subject development site without the prior written approval of council's environment, sorry, environment branch. It will be necessary for the applicant and any subsequent owners to make a formal application, including a plan, outlining reasons for clearing and identifying the impacts of such a clearing. So it can be difficult to find old development permits for a site if you're not the owner, 
like if you're a member of the community, it can be difficult to find them. Sometimes you'll find them on council websites. Um, but if you're, we're working for council in this case, so let's just say we've got access to all of the past permits. We look through when we find this condition. Well, how does that fit within the legislation? So um, we need to locate the law um, and follow cross-references and think logically about it. So, and you need to basically have the confidence to do those things to work within the planning system. So I've given you this handout. If you just grab that out, you see there's three basic um, rules of statutory interpretation. The first is to find the statute in force at the time relevant to your problem and any related document. And there's two important bits to that. Um, so you might say, oh, we're going to go to the Planning Act. This is a planning problem. Um, well, it needs to be the act as in force at the time of the offence occurring. So if the offence is occurring now, then we're looking at the current act. And any related documents, and that's an important bit to it because basically we need to find um, the subsidiary things that hang under the Act and then interpret them in the context of the Act. Once we've got the related documents, we need to, what I suggest is the second step, if you're not familiar with the document, is to skim read it and identify the relevant bits. And then those relevant bits, and, and often a lot of interpretation is about basically putting aside the things that are irrelevant to your problem. So finding the bits that are relevant. And then the third step is interpreting the relevant bits according to their ordinary meaning, reading the words in context and in, within the context of the purpose. So they're the three basic steps. If you can do them, then you can basically solve 95% of problems. So I say 95%. And the reason why I say that, um, this table looks horribly complicated. It comes from some research I did years ago. Um, but I really want to make the point that most statutory interpretation is not done by courts. There's only about 150 like decisions of the Planning and Environment Court each year in Queensland. Um, it's only a small fraction of the actual work in the development sector. So if we look at, this was a development applications and planning appeals in 2008, 2009, so a decade ago, um, by state. And then if you look in the second column, there's a number of development applications. You might even just look down at the bottom, the total. Um, or, um, so we don't go through, you know, if you're getting lost in that table. So um, across Australia, the total was a quarter of a million development applications across Australia. Um, in Queensland, 23,000. So tens of thousands of applications. Of that, the number of appeals across Australia was only 6,000. Well, I say only, you might say 6,000, that's a lot of appeals. But if you look at it in the context of how many applications there were, there was only, like it was less than 3%. In Queensland, it was about 2.5% of development applications were subject to an appeal. Now, and this is the, the next bit where it really drops down, because often, as a developer, you will appeal, you're unhappy with a decision, you will appeal to maintain your rights while you try and negotiate a better outcome. And 80% of appeals to the Queensland Planning Environment Court are resolved by consent. So only a small fraction actually go on to be decided by the court. Because as a developer, like I'm in, involved, acting for developers now, you appeal because you're unhappy with something and you want the opportunity to negotiate, but you don't really, you know, then it becomes a question of do you spend 30, 30 to $50,000 going forward or do you, it, it becomes a money question. So if, for instance, you're unhappy with a condition and the condition imposes say $5 million worth of costs, so the condition requires you to build a road or sewerage or something like that, and infrastructure is fiendishly expensive, but if the condition requires you to um, build something that's <coughs> going to cost you $5 million, and you've got experts that say, well, you're only contributing 10% of the need for that infrastructure, that the council's really freeloading on you, and you're building something that lots of others will use, and you shouldn't have to pay for it all, then if you're basically, if 10% of the need for the infrastructure comes from your development, then you should only be paying 
effectively 10% of it. So if, think about that, if the cost of the condition is $5 million and you've got experts saying you're only contributing 10%, so the, you should only be contributing $500,000, then there's a $4.5 million gap. And that is a big bloody war chest to go off to court to fight the council with. Um, so um, the majority of appeals in the PE court are not by the community. The community doesn't have the resources, it's expensive and scary and all of those things. The vast majority of appeals are from developers who are unhappy with government decisions. And it's typically driven by a financial decision. So most planning appeals are effectively commercial litigation. You're trying to reduce the costs of your development and fight often about conditions that are expensive for you. And it often just becomes a financial question. So I'm acting, at the moment, I'm acting for someone up the coast and there's these conditions that have been imposed upon them, but they don't want to, like they can comply with the conditions and it might cost them say fifteen, twenty thousand dollars to basically comply. So it's not really worth going on to trial because it'll cost them more than that in experts and lawyers than complying with the conditions. But they're trying to find some compromise in between. So we don't really want to go into trial. If it was a five hundred thousand dollar question, we'd be off to court tomorrow. Well, not tomorrow, but you know, we'd be. It would be a lot more enthusiasm for going to court. So often appeals are basically money driven. So, but see the step over there from. Um, about 3% of development applications are appealed, but then only 1% go on to um, ultimately to be decided by the courts. So you're down to 1%, uh, and in Queensland it's 0.5 of a percent. Half a percent of development applications end up in the P&E court as a contested um, decision. And then of that, in, um, there's only a very few appeals to the Court of Appeal. So in Queensland in that year it was only about 10, be similar sort of numbers now. Um, so you're down to 0.04% in Queensland and then no appeals <coughs> to the High Court. The High Court basically rarely, very, very rarely deals with planning environment issues now. They basically leave it to the state courts. So in that context, um, and why I think that these numbers are significant is if you went and look at the Court of Appeal decisions, if you're thinking about statutory interpretation, if you go and look at Court of Appeal decisions and you see it was fiendishly complicated and the Court of Appeal, like there's this recent decision about infrastructure charges, um, that have, there's a 2-1 two, two decision in the Court of Appeal and you look at it and it looks fiendishly complicated, but why go and look at that as the example when that's so rare. The vast bulk of um, planning applications never even see a lawyer. <coughs> It'll be dealt with by planning consultant, preparing a development, giving advice to a client. You know, it's a standard development which, yes, we need to code accessible. Yep, we can handle that application for you. They put together the forms with some, you know, the reports. They give it to the council, the council planning staff. Um, deal with it and they might have you know engineers and others that come in on it but there's not typically lawyers involved in your run-of-the-mill applications it's only where you get to it being you know confrontational um, and potential litigation typically that lawyers become involved folk that work for councils is that the way it works for you guys like is anyone working in a development assessment team not these days, but I have you have in the past so in your development assessment team, what are the sort of staff that assess an application? Yeah, you don't get up to lawyers unless it's a little bit iffy, you might call the council lawyer, you might call you. Yep, so, so typically you'll have a town planner? Town planner. And a, a, a an ecologist, planner. potentially? Yeah. It depends on what are the issues involved. An engineer, you know, if there's some infrastructure issue involved. You can have, like BCC works in um, its development assessment teams that will typically be multidisciplinary, but they don't typically involve a lawyer. So those people are all interpreting the law and deciding applications within the legal framework, but they're not <coughs> lawyers. So I really just want to emphasize, the most of this work is done by non-lawyers. Can I just ask you a quick question? Yes. What's going on in Victoria? Why do they have so much more? 
Um, Victoria has, yeah, they've got their own um, VCAT uh, and they're, um, it's a really interesting jurisdiction um, in terms of the litigation um, and um, it just, yeah, has tens of thousands. There have been attempts to reform it but it's the standout, isn't it, um, in terms of numbers. Um, New South Wales is obviously huge as well uh, in terms of gross numbers um, but yeah, Victoria just stands out. Um, it's a very active planning bar down there, so, yeah? Do you think with the reform of the uh, Environmental Protection Act in Victoria, bringing in GED and environmental harm and the onus on the polluter to rectify those is going to increase <coughs> those appeals numbers when great, it comes to planning? Great question, but no, I don't, I don't really think so, um, b because essentially the Environmental Protection Act, I think a lot of, you know, the, a lot of the litigation is pure planning issues, you know, people in Melbourne who are unhappy with development around them and litigation around it, yeah. rather than essentially their, you know, the reforms of their environmental laws. Most of these sorts of things aren't environment as such, they're more a sort of planning context about height or setback. Or I know that that's environment, but it's not natural environment yeah. sort of issues. Okay, so, um, yes? Have you done any analysis of more recent figures or is your gut feeling that those percentages would be fairly similar? Yeah, the, 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 my feeling is that they are um, very similar, certainly in terms of the appeals in for Queensland. I was able to do this report because there was this, that's the only time I've ever seen it, was a report that came out from um, COAG, basically, which gave the figures for around, um, so those first two columns came from a report and then essentially I did work with a research assistant following through and getting the levels of appeal within each of those jurisdictions. There's a lot of work in just creating this table, but it was only possible because of a COAG report and the, the basic <coughs> numbers coming from it. Actually, there are, like, there's some good data on Queensland, Victoria and New South Wales sort of planning assessments, but I was really interested in across Australia. Yep. And, and also it was responding to the sort of um, green lawfare sort of arguments and that sort of, like, a lot of times when you, when, you know, when governments talk about the, the objection system and appeal rights and we're looking at impact assessment and those sorts of things, you know, and it's like the focus is on, you know, busybody community people objecting, that's just a furphy because the bulk of, of objections, sorry, the bulk of litigation is between developers and councils and developers are really happy with having the planning and environment court there because often you can just use it as a vehicle to um, bring a local government to its knees, particularly if you think about Noosa, it's just faced so much litigation because the land there is so valuable and there have been these massive appeals run um, about against Noosa. And from a, if, from a developer's perspective, if you can take a $10 million land that's worth $10 million and put a development that increases the value of the land you know, to $50 million, then that is a massive pot of gold that you're working towards. What does local government get for, for defending that appeal? Nothing. There's no pot of gold for local government. So if you're Noosa Shire Council and you're facing 10 massive development applications, um, like what do you do? How do you fund that? Like what do you do? So from um, the development <coughs> sector, there's the, the P&E court has a lot of advantages. It allows you to fight a lot of things. Um, don't get sucked into the furphy that this is about community rights. <coughs> There's a lot of advantages from the from a developer's perspective, and and they can um, appeal code accessible decisions as well, code and impact. You know, you a, a community member can't appeal a code accessible development, but a proponent can. And you can appeal all of the conditions as well. Yep. Could the, could the two New South Wales and Victorian figures reflect the fact that I, I think it's still the case that there's a stage before you go to what we have as a court. There's a, a sort of an ADR step beforehand. So after we have the experts having their discussions, you go to the court here, whereas in, I think in New South Wales still, and certainly in Victoria was, there was a step where you went to a kind of commissioner who sat in a kind of 
but the knowledgeable person who wasn't necessarily a lawyer I, might have been a town planner. I don't know if that's the case for those states. Uh, it's like certainly, the reviews are different in that sense to an appeal. I don't know okay, to the, the level of detail. Okay. Like I have friends that in New South Wales and Victoria, but I've never really worked in their planning systems. Yeah, okay. I'm obviously <laughs> very familiar with well, Queensland. I'll find out for you. <coughs> it's an interesting point. Sure. There. Yeah. Okay. Just, um, Did you have a? Lawyers, yep. they would have studied environmental and planning law as part of their qualifications, so they would yeah. be thrown in, into it at the deep end kind of thing. Sort of yeah. P potentially, but like a lot of people, like if you've done a straight science degree, like a town planner, yes, but if you've done a straight science degree, like I did a science degree in ecology, we don't do law, and you might then be an ecologist, you might have got an arts degree, like and now be working, you know, you've retrained and you know, a lot of people have never studied law, and also there's a lot of law that's badly taught as well. Yeah, so. Yeah, I'm, I'm just saying, like, I know that I did it at undergrad and yep. postgrad. Okay. So it sort of, it does. Um, yeah, but they're not lawyers. Okay, in terms of um, courts, um, the P and E court is our main um, court in terms of appeals, um, but there's a whole range of other courts in our state system as well as the federal system. So um, the P&E court is the main one for planning appeals. But don't get, you know, barristers wear robes and the like. It's not just the lawyers, the judges that do statutory interpretation. It's everyday people like you and me. Okay, so let's go through our steps. So our problem is, uh, can we stop this development? We're acting for council. We um, basically need to understand the law. So if we follow our three steps, you can find the law in force at the time relevant to your question in any related document um, on the state government website particularly. Um, so you can you know, um, go to legislationqld.gov.au. Uh, Commonwealth has its own website. They're the best ones to use and you can get... I'll actually do it. So if you go to that website, I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, I'm not going to, so um, it allows you to look at the legislation as in force. So if we're dealing with a current problem, um, we're thinking it's the Planning Act, so we've you know, looked at potential laws that apply, we're identifying as potentially the Planning Act, we go down, you know, it's like a lovely library. <coughs> I've already gone past it. Um, there we go. Um, sorry, my eyesight. Uh, so, this is such a fantastic website. Uh, it's, I think, better than the Commonwealth one, and it has been. So, our Office of Queensland Parliamentary Councils does a fantastic job. Um, just in stark contrast, I've been teaching, um, and I've, I've just gone through the admission process. To be, I'm working on illegal logging in Papua New Guinea at the moment, and going through the admission process to the PNG <coughs> bar, and you can't get anything like this um, for Papua New Guinea. In fact, you can't even get current laws that are consolidated on even on their national parliament website. Um, there's just nothing like this. So we're very fortunate to have it, and it gives essentially the whole legislative um, scheme at your fingertip. And what I typically do is, so it gives you a point in time and links to subordinate legislation, but you can download the PDF and what I typically do is um, get the point in time. Don't get to, I'd never print out a copy of the acts, just basically get used to working with them electronically. Get, spend the money on getting a decent um, computer monitor that's big enough to open um, a PDF document like this, um, two pages to one. And what I would typically do is work on the legislation like and so if it's big enough like an A4 page then essentially you can just work with your monitor because you can't you don't want to print anything out and just have a marked up version of the act because you know the benefit of the website is you can just go and get the most recent version and assume that it is 
you know, current and up to date and, and <coughs> you'll often do that and the law often is amended. So, and the key thing with this, so we found, now we found the law, okay, let's just say that this is our key document and the next step in our statutory interpretation process is to skim read it and identify the bits that are relevant to our problem. So get, be, become very friendly with the table of contents because they are in a, in a complicated document. The table of contents is a great friend. It allows you to identify the relevant bits easily and then you can focus in on them because as I say, one of the big things, the biggest challenges is identifying what's irrelevant and, and ignoring it. And also, with any complicated document or laws, they typically have um, terms that are defined in a schedule. So the dictionary, right at the end. Um, so when you're reading the act, you need to interpret the sections by reference to the dictionary and any terms that are defined. So um, what you can, like what I often have done in classes, is to go through and work through this act. Let's just do it. So we want to go through and identify the, the bits that are relevant to our problem. So basically, um, does this clearing comply <coughs> with the law? And if not, what can we do about it? That's what we're trying to work out. So does it comply with this act? We're looking for something that might make it unlawful. So um, if we work through it, and you can, if you want to, write this down on, I, I often, if I'm dealing with a new big document, I might open up a page and then just write down, you know, some key sections as you go along. So you're making a little summary. So if you've got a page, let's just do work through our chapters. So we're skim reading this document. So we can start with chapter one. And uh, what I might do, even though I normally work with it as, I'll just make it bigger so that you can actually see it. So we look in chapter one and we find there's the introductory things like the, the objects of the act, but there's some cross references. The definitions are in the schedule. Um, so that's chapter one. Nothing there that on its face stops this clearing occurring. So we then go to chapter two and basically we find we're just looking at the table of contents there on the left. Um, this, we look at this chapter and we find this is about making planning instruments. So at a state level, we've got the state planning instruments, which uh, goes through the process of making them. And there's regional plans and the state planning policies. And so it's about the process of making them. And there's also local planning instruments and the process of making them. Um, nothing there in chapter two that says you can't, you know, breach a planning scheme or there's nothing there that stops you doing something. So chapter two, um, unless we have to go back to it for some cross-reference, isn't relevant to us stopping this proposal. So chapter three is the development assessment system. And again, we can go and look at that <coughs> and we'll find that it's all about the mechanics of lodging a development application. Well, in this case, they've got a development approval, which there's a permit, uh, sorry, there's conditions attached to, but they haven't applied. So they're not following this process. They're doing something without going through the application process. But we find in chapter three, there's nothing that says you can't do, you know, you can't clear land or there's nothing in that that prohibits. So chapter three, we say is irrelevant and move on. Then chapter four is about infrastructure. And these chapters have, these, these have become big parts of planning legislation because infrastructure is so expensive and so controversial. And the development sector hates, you know, give, being slugged $20,000 for every lot. If you're developing a, you know, if you've got a hundred lots, uh, you multiply it by 20,000, that's a lot of money. Um, so infrastructure charges around roads, sewerage, uh, and other forms of infrastructure are very expensive, very controversial. So there's a whole chapter in the planning legislation about local governments um, creating um, uh, basically infrastructure um, uh, 
provisions um, and basically uh, infrastructure, infrastructure charges. Um, so, but nothing about vegetation clearing. So we could go and look at chapter three and we find it's irrelevant. Then chapter five, offences and enforcement. So um, I'll come back to that, but dispute resolution chapter six, ch chapter seven miscellaneous, chapter eight is repeal and transitional, and then the dictionary. So obviously chapter five, that looks interesting immediately. So, and, and the point being though, we're skim reading it, skim reading it identifying relevant bits. Um, we go into chapter, chapter five, and we start reading it and we find section 162, carrying out prohibited development is unlawful. 163, carrying out accessible development without a permit um, is unlawful. And section 164, compliance with the development approval. So six, section 163 and 164 are the two biggest offences. They're the common ones that are essentially the whole system revolves around because this is what this is the prohibition on doing things unless you've got a permit and a development approval so remember I said that before the, the systems work by prohibiting something unless you've got an approval so these provisions are sort of the core of the planning system because they require someone who wants to develop their land to go and get an approval if they're carrying out accessible development um, and if they don't do that, they're committing an offence and they can receive a big fine. Um, in Queensland, we've made a, a policy decision for many decades not to have um, imprisonment available as a sentencing option. My view is we should have sentence of, sentences of imprisonment open. It's a real, you know, the fact that it's essentially it's a white collar offence. Um, we don't basically send people to jail for a planning offence, but if, like in a project like this, um, where we're a council and we're trying to stop this development of land and someone knows that they're, um, we've told them not to do it, they're going in, they've hired security guards, it's for a development that's worth hundreds of millions of dollars, <coughs> they're basically, they know they're going to get some sort of fine. But if it means that they can get their $100 million development and the fine is only, say, a million dollars, then there's a commercial incentive to actually go and do it. That's only about 600,000. Sorry? That, no, 164 is only about 600,000. Um, multiply it by five for a corporation. Uh, and then a penalty so unit, I think. Five for a corporation, uh, it is, yeah. So the Penalties and Sentences Act. So don't, um, yeah. Um, the penalty units, if, if it's not prescribed for a um, specific reference to a corporation, if you go to the Penalties and Sentences Act, it says for any maximum for involving a corporation, you multiply it by five, and then you multiply the 4,500 by five by, I think a penalty unit now is $130, yeah. is it? It's 13155 but I think it's been updated really Okay, recently. so if you work out, someone got a calculator? 131, let's work out what the maximum fine is. So let's just say it's a corporation. So 450, 4,500 by, let's just say $130 by five is, what's our grand total? If you can do that in your head, you're far smart. Well, I'm sure you're far smarter than me anyway, but. Um, <laughs> sorry, 2.9 million? Yeah. So um, I think there's, you can up it for heritage as well, but essentially you're looking at a $3 million maximum fine. So if you have got a development that, you know, something is standing in your way, um, and, and again, there's increases for heritage because, you know, heritage is a classic where there's some little, you know, like you're here in Brisbane City, and there's some little facade that is a real bugbear to you as a developer that council really loves. It's got some historic significance to some, you know, lovely fluffy idea from the 60s or something or earlier and you know this facade and it's really mucking up what you can do with the site then you know just having a bulldozer that oh you know we were just turning the grater and it just knocked it and now it's sorry it's structurally unsound and it's got to come down such a shame but you know so heritage particularly can be really problematic 
um, from a developer's perspective and knocking it over can be um, you know, really advantageous from a financial perspective. So we've got a $3 million <coughs> maximum fine. You can't go to jail for it though. But um, to work out Section 163, we'd have to basically go and work through whether it's accessible development. We're going to look at that in the later lecture about IDAS. I just want to focus in on, I've already mentioned to you that there's an approval, um, a development approval. Under transitional provisions, even though the approval was given back in 1996, it's still picked up and still a development approval under the current Planning Act. So, and it, the approvals apply to the <coughs> land, not the individual. So the approval applies to the land and anyone that breaches it, breaches the approval. Um, one question <coughs> about it, um, a person must not contravene a development approval. So does that include conditions? Might be a question because this is a breach of a condition. Um, and just to answer that simple question, if you go to the dictionary, you'll find develop and approval section 49.1. So it's a, we've gone to the dictionary and as a cross-reference to go back to the Act. Back to the Act. Act. So we go to um, section 49. What is a development approval, preliminary approval, development permit? A development approval is a preliminary approval, the development permit, a combination of them. If we go through the section, we find that this subsection 5, in this act, a reference to a development approval includes the development conditions imposed on the approval. So can you see all we've done is we've basically followed the cross-reference. So we went from the section saying it's an offence to breach the development approval. Our question is, does that include conditions? We went to the dictionary, it sent us back to a condition, and all we've done is follow the cross-references. So that's basically statutory interpretation 101. And then um, basically we need to plug in the condition to it. So that's a related document. To, so to interpret whether there is a breach of the section, we need to also interpret it in the context of the condition. So we skim read the act and these are the, you know, the few key um, relevant sections. So section 164 imposes this offence of breaching a development approval and then we know from section 49 that that includes the conditions. So then are they breaching the condition? It's an offence to breach a condition. The condition says no clearing of native vegetation is to occur on the subject development site without the prior written approval of Council's Environment Branch, which they don't have, um, it will be necessary to make an application and identify the impacts, which they haven't done. So are they in breach of the condition? Absolutely. Yes. Simple yes. So they're in breach of the condition. Now, I, I put on your handout the optional step of searching for court decisions. I say it's optional because generally you don't need to do it and generally what you'll find, particularly if you're looking at planning and environment court decisions, is the decision ultimately um, only really tells you, in terms of the law, it pretty well only tells you what you would have gotten to anyway by the first three steps. P&E decisions typically are very factual based. It depends on the expert evidence and how the, <coughs> you know, how the, the merits of the particular application. So they're very factual, rather than the law really being the key thing that decided the um, decision. So they can be useful to go and look at decisions, the Planning Environment Court, to understand, you know, to illustrate how the law might act in operation. But it's that they rarely, you know, it's not like a precedent that you typically can apply um, to resolve the particular issue that you have. So certainly as a lawyer, I'd go and look for court decisions. But it's actually quite <coughs> difficult if you're not a lawyer to even work out what are the relevant decisions, um, and the law is changing all of the time. There's a whole level of complexity with trying to do that. And what I'm saying to you is generally you don't need to do it. If you can basically go from the Act through the regulations in the planning scheme, you can pretty well work everything out. 
Okay, recognize your limits within that because uh, there should be a big red flag. So say you're a consultant uh, and you're, well, let's just say we're the, we're, we're, we're the council enforcement officer. We haven't done a law degree uh, and you know, we've got a science background, we've been working for council, we've done compliance training um, and we're basically trying to shut down this development um, the developers hopping mad about it we you know we've got to go off to court you know this is a sort of situation where there's risks involved in this and if we're not confident in what we're doing we basically need to go and you know I, I say it like this a big red flag should come up in your head and you should say hmm I need to get advice on this or you know you can go and talk with your manager mm -hmm. uh, and if they if you can't work it out yourselves um, then you know, talk within your organisation. If there's lawyers within your organisation, talk with them, or potentially brief, um, you know, seek advice from um, from lawyers. Uh, that's in situations where there's risks involved, either financial or reputation or something, and you really you look at it and you can't work it out. That's relatively rare. You can't be a town planner, for instance, without being able to do basic you know, interpretation of your planning scheme and basic things within the IDAS, not IDAS, the development assessment process. So you need to be able to, to do your job, you need to be able to do the basics, but there will be occasions where, you know, a big red flag should come up. So allow for difficult cases, but, you know, generally if you do those three steps, you can solve most problems. Okay, so, um, if I just wanted to cover off on something, we said we've decided there's been an offence, but if we're working, if we're coming from council's perspective, there's a question of, well, what should we do about it now? Um, so what action can be taken and, um, you know, should we take it? And that's a discretionary question. Yes? Um, uh, I know you said before that uh, the area was mapped as Cat X under the Vegetation Management Act. Yep, so non-remnant vegetation. Yep. Under the uh, Nature Conservation Act, could there potentially be offences for like protected plants and spot capture type things as well? Possibly. Yeah, the Nature Conservation Act is an interesting um, problem. I, I see as a developer, I was giving advice to someone up in Cairns where I was really surprised at how the Nature Conservation Act applied. So that can be a trip up for um, vegetation uh, clearing. So potentially, certainly if I was advising the developer, I'd be wanting to look at those sorts of things. You know, there's a whole host of things that potentially could apply. As the council, we don't administer that act. So, you know, we could contact QPWS and say, you know, they're, they're yeah, breaching yeah. this. And I guess but that's where I was going with the question is, would one of the things you do, aside from looking at your own DA conditions, be to refer this um, potential offence to the relevant authority? For potentially, um, but ultimately, if you you know if they don't want to come in and help, uh, then you know the question falls back to you. And from a council like it was Caloundra City Council at the time, now Sunshine Coast Regional Council. So what, Sunshine is it Sunshine Coast Regional Council or Sunshine yes. Coast Council? Yes, yeah, regional absolutely. Council. Yeah. So which incorporated the old Caloundra City Council and others around it. So. Um, its question is, you know, we want to stop development going further south and we actually want to protect it from an environmental perspective and protect Palmerstone Passage. So we've got a real interest here in, in stopping this sort of development. So hasn't a development offence been committed? We've said yes, they're breaching the conditions. So then what enforcement actions should we take? And that's a matter of discretion. And typically, um, so modern environmental laws and planning laws typically give multiple things that a regulator can do. And the broad idea around regulation is built around a regulatory pyramid or an enforcement pyramid, where as a regulator, you basically try to educate the regulated community about you know, what they need to do to comply with the law, and you try and get them in compliance. So broadly, you don't need to take any action. This is the bottom tier. No enforcement action necessary because people are in compliance. And that's broadly, you know, most people, you know, in their day-to-day -day activities, they don't breach planning laws. That's what you want. Yes, Margaret? Um, question. Um, I can see there might be a bit of a difficult difference in that the developer hasn't applied 
declare it and hasn't been knocked back. So the council hasn't said anything about its reasons for not wanting the clearing. Um, and maybe, maybe this is the smart thing the developer does, which is to just go ahead and not apply because they're thinking of what those reasons might be, which are now not in play. Well, yeah, council have have said they don't want the clearing, or they don't want the area developed. So from the developer's perspective, they're getting rid of the trees because they then plan to follow through with the development application. But they're getting rid of, th that's really what was happening in the background. You're getting rid of the trees. You know that to do the, you know, the houses and the like, you're going to need to get approval. But if you get rid of the trees, you reduce the biodiversity values that council is yeah. trying to protect. But how, how do we, where, where, do, where do what the council is trying to protect, where does that come into all this interplay? Well, because, let, because if you have, yep. if the developer hasn't applied yep. and, be, and been knocked back, well, let's work through because this is yep. from a regulator regulator's perspective. We've got multiple things we can do. What we first off, we want to not have to to not. In, sorry, we want, we want to be in a situation where we don't have to enforce anything because people are in compliance. That's what we want. So we can we can bring people into compliance with education campaigns, you know, and the like. So that's the broad thing that you want. A step up from that is education and warning notices. So you go out, you find a landholder who's in slight breach, you talk to them and they didn't understand the law, um, you might give them a warning notice or you know, tell them what they need to do. So that's a low level thing. A step up from that is administrative action where you don't have to go to court. So penalty infringement notices or tickets are the main thing that's used and the advantage for you as a regulator, is that what are the advantages of a pin? Anyone? Yeah, no, no cost to go into court. Yep, there's a lot of work and effort in going to court. Let's just say the fine is a couple of thousand dollars. Mm. You know, it's pin that's a couple yeah. of thousand dollars. So, little effort, few people challenge them basically. So, you basically mm. get a, a fine, a small fine, but not a lot of, and not a lot of effort in it. Um, then you step into having to go to court where you wanted to restrain something or getting a big, um, you know, an order from a court and then full-blown criminal prosecution and that in typically involves a lot more effort from you. So that's the enforcement pyramid. In terms of all of those options are potentially open to us, but there's three big things that drive <coughs> where you, what option you choose, um, <coughs> the harm, the fault and the remediation effort. So. If it's something that is really harmful, you don't have to start with a warning notice. You can go straight to a criminal prosecution. Just as, like, you might have no criminal history, but if you walk yeah. out from this seminar and you think that the world is so bad you have to kill someone, and you go and kill someone down in South Bank, and the police come, they're going to arrest you and take you away, and you're going to be charged with murder, and you're going to go to jail for many, many years. So you had a completely unble unblemished um, history up until that point, but it's such a serious offence, you're going to go to jail. Similarly with environmental offences, they can be really serious and you don't have to start at the bottom and work up. Um, fault is some offences can be innocent, you know, people didn't understand the law, there was a mistake, um, through to full-blown, um, we knew we were breaching the law, full-blown criminality where there's attempts to conceal and deceive. So classic red flags for, from an investigator's perspective for um, uh, high fault are attempts to conceal um, and mis trying to mislead you as well. Um, so here, what have we... Oh, I'll finish you off with remediation effort. So you might go out as a regulator and find that there's an offence, it's fairly serious, but the company gets in and they start, they, they rec oh geez, we didn't understand. Um, you know, we're going to fix it straight away. They get in, they put in a big remediation effort and spend a lot of money fixing it. They say, we've got now a new management plan which we're going to implement. Here it is. And you're satisfied as an investigator that, um, you know, it's unlikely that they'll reoffend. So in that sort of situation, the remediation effort can take it down a notch. So instead of prosecuting them, you might just decide to give them a pin. So those are the three big factors. So if we think about it here, what's the level of harm? High. Very high. 
very sensitive area, um, clearing, and they're planning to keep going. So um, potential threatened species, you know, um, Ramsar wetland, pumicestone passage, high fisheries values, very high. Fault. You're not going to get a higher level of fault than this. It's obvious criminality done for a commercial purpose with intent, oh sorry, with attempts to conceal. So they've got the security guard preventing your investigator coming onto site. They've been and spoken with you. They know they're in breach of the law. This is about commercial gain and that's it. So in terms of fault, this is right up there. Um, and in terms of remediation, they're not stopping. They're going to keep going. So um, this all leaps up to criminal prosecution. You happy with that? Okay, one problem with criminal prosecution from the regulator's perspective is that under planning laws, um, so under normal criminal law, if an offence is occurring, what do the police do? They stop it. They arrest someone. They arrest someone. Mm -hmm. and, that, and then take you off to jail. So that's how we stop normal crimes. Um, but in the planning system, there's no arrest powers as such. Um, you can't go to the magistrate's court where you would begin a prosecution and get an interim order. So basically you might file your complaint but it'll be a few weeks before you can get your first return date potentially. So they've finished their clearing by then. You can't go off and get immediate orders. So a restraint order um, in our system, you can go to the Planning and Environment Court and get a restraining order and you can get that very quickly. So what council did was they raced off to the Planning and Environment Court and that afternoon got an uh, enforcement order say basically ordering them to stop work and went and basically gave that to the developers and shut them down. And the advantage of getting an order from the court is what? They go to jail if they're... Yeah, it's basically coming with a bazooka and pointing it at their head because if you breach a court order, um, I said that we can't send people to jail for breaching the planning laws, but if you breach a court order, that's contempt of court and you can go to jail. Uh, and I had the, I'm not sure if honour is the right word, um, I represented a man who was the first person ever to be sent to jail for um, breaching a planning environment court orders uh, and he went to jail for three months. Um, so don't do it would be my message. Um, it wasn't, he had fantastic legal representation, I would point out. <laughs> <laughs> but he did go to jail. Uh, so, um, court orders basically give you a big stick. And um, that's what you can use to shut them down. But in the p &E court, you can't get a fine. So, um, unfortunately, this... Uh, you, you have prosecution policies like Brisbane City Council, Department of Environment and Science. But it basically, it's those three factors, harm, fault, and remediation effort. There's a range of other considerations they look at, but it comes down to those three are the big things as to what, because they, they have all of these tools available. The question is often, what do we do in this circumstance? You know, it's sort of borderline a pin. Do we take an enforcement? You know, what do we do? So it's all around, there's broad ideas around responsive regulation. Um, I won't worry about that, but um, basically in this case, it ended up there being three um, court cases. One was um, in the Planning and Environment Court to get an enforcement um, order. That was appealed to the Court of Appeal, um, where the developer argued that the condition was uh, unlawful and tried to get it basically severed. Uh, um, from the development approval, and um, uh, Justice Keane, Justice, it was Justice of Appeal Keane, who's now in the High Court, Riley, he's such a great judge, and he said, and the developer, somewhat surprisingly, um, although, you know, it's actually Danny Gore acting for the developer, I think, in this case, uh, and he, um, they argued if the condition couldn't be severed, then the whole development approval was invalid, and Justice Keane was, well, that might be surprising that they're happy for the whole development approval to be ruled invalid. Um, but um, in the context where the development has already occurred and the, um, you know, the local council isn't going to want them to pull out their golf course, it's 
you know, it's basically a, a, a ploy because what they really wanted to do was get rid of the condition. And he said, the condition is valid. Um, and so they were restrained from the clearing. Um, they then appealed to the planning environment, or they lodged a development application. And, and when that was refused by council, appealed to the PE court and ultimately lost that. Um, there was also a criminal prosecution of the company, which council had trouble with because the, the magistrate got um, taken down, the, led down the garden path by the developer's lawyers. And the magistrate initially ruled that because the wording of the condition said they needed approval from council's environment branch, and that no longer existed in the council hierarchy, that the condition was, couldn't be complied with and was invalid. The council then appealed that to the planning and the district court, but as Judge Robin, a <coughs> penny judge who sitting as the district court, heard the appeal and said, well, that's wrong. The um, condition was valid and sent it back to the magistrate's court. By that time, though, the uh, company had gone into liquidation and council decided not to proceed because there was nothing, there was no fine that they could get. But a lot of litigation, from council's perspective, no pot of gold. All they did was manage to stop the development of this land and essentially protect the habitat values around Palmerstone Passage. Um, but if you think about it in the context of, if you're a council in a high development area like the Sunshine Coast, if you don't take strong action in these sorts of cases, you pretty well, you'll have nothing left pretty quickly because um, if it simply becomes a financial question for many developers, you know, do we clear and knock it down and then put in our DA and get it approved and we get a $100 million development and a $1 million, $3 million fine, if, it's, if that's the question, <laughs> they're going to knock it down and take the fine. So lessons for regulators. Um, so quick action can be really important and the initiative taken by the council officers I think in this case was outstanding and they're acting to prevent a calculated breach of planning laws for commercial gain and these that's drone, sorry these days you could use a drone yes these days you could use a drone um, but yeah <laughs> <laughs> so um, it still was a huge initiative from, from the council responding really quickly and if you don't do that in the high development areas then basically there's a perverse incentive to breach the law. So just a postscript on that, um, went back, I went to the site in 2010 so yeah this is the cleared area in 2004 so there was a fight over how to rehabilitate it um, and the council wanted it basically just left so it could reshoot. On the left you see the area that's reshooting, on the right is some of the trees that weren't um, pulled over. And when I was there in 2010 it was already you know, well over your head and you're walking around thinking, gosh I bet there's a lot of snakes <laughs> in here in this grass. So you can see all the trees coming back up and there's, you can see the stumps of one of the trees that's been pulled over there in the foreground. So essentially just natural restoration. Just want to mention before we, we take a break, um, the recent decision in Fairmont Group. So this is a case again from, um, well, Moreton Bay Regional Council area, but um, a dispute about um, preemptive clearing for a, um, or no, an application to clear linked to a proposal for a master plan community on a site. So what the developer had um, the developer basically was talking with, was, had put in an application for vegetation clearing under the local government planning scheme and then council re refused the application and then the developer had a change of heart and decided that they shouldn't even have to apply to council because the land was all category X, so shown as non-remnant vegetation and therefore under the planning regulations there was no trigger for approval from the state government and they were arguing that that made it exempt development that couldn't be made accessible development under a local government planning scheme and so that's what the regulated vegetation maps look like so all white um, in reality there's quite a few trees you can see the blue sort of this is this is the land they were applying over if you actually go down to ground level the trees from a biodiversity perspective don't you know it's all just park residential area people with you know lawns and native trees but you know there's no understory that's not high ecological values.
Um, and if you look at, like, this is one of the other areas that was proposed to be cleared. There's pine trees, so exotic species, a lot of weeds in that. Um, but council refused because they're pushing, you know, there's a range of overlays about um, uh, catchment protection overlay and um, nature conservation overlay. Council is basically trying to push for better biodiversity conservation and waterways protection. And they refused. And that's when the developer decided we want to take our bat and ball and go home. And they went and challenged council's ability to even regulate it. Uh, and it went all the way to the Court of Appeal, and the Court of Appeal um, has said in a 2-1 decision that the local government um, planning scheme can regulate vegetation, even if it's not caught at a state government level. That's essentially what the decision decides. So I just mentioned that because uh, it's one that was in the news just very recently. Um, so key messages from this lecture. A central challenge you face in your careers uh, is to navigate multiple careers or, you know, if you're in the community, then engaging with the planning system is navigating multiple large overlapping acts and related documents at the same time. Um, you often need to do this while dealing with multiple levels of government and bridging the transition from old and new. There's some basic skills um, that you can use to achieve that and I hope that that's been useful for you. Ultimately, the problems, you know, they're complex and you can't get around from actually just going and reading the documents and swimming around in them, I often describe it as. You know, and you, it just takes time. The good thing is, once you get used to the scheme in an area, like if you're a planner and, and you're working with in Brisbane City Council area, then you'll get very used to the Brisbane City Plan. So the first time you do it, it takes ages, but then very quickly you, you become used to the, you know what's there and you can quickly jump through it. So once you know what zone it's in, you might even know off the top of your head what the sort of controls are because you've dealt with previous applications. So obviously these, these steps are when you're new to an area or new to a document, um, but hopefully they're useful for you. Any questions on that? Yep. What's the process for them to so quickly go and get a court order? What was the process for them so quickly to go and get a court order? So courts can act, it might seem um, a surprise for people. Often courts seem to take ages, but basically, if there's something really urgent, then basically, like a like a barrister can um, walk in. Basically, there's a duty um, judge, or you can you can contact the registry and say, "We need an urgent order. I need a judge, you know, pretty well right now." Uh, and you know, walk from chambers down to court. You'll get, um, you know, basically allowed to say why it's urgent. It'll be ex parte, so you won't have the other side there. And typically the court will only give you an order on really strong um, evidence or, you know, um, from, you've got to, you've got to have a really strong basis and then the order will only give you a bridge until you can get the other party into um, court to respond. Um, so typical sort of urgent cases might be if there's development going on and a building beside it is about to collapse, then you're in the building that's about to collapse. You can race off to court and get an order for them to, you know, pin the walls or stop what they're doing. You know, if you've got something that's really urgent, you can get an immediate order from a court, you know, really quickly. So that, that's why they needed the, the helicopter or aerial footage? Yeah, well, they got, the, they got evidence. They didn't know what was going on. They could, you know, hear clearing or whatever. They could probably hear the bulldozers. But basically, they went and got the photographs and then raced off to the Planning Environment Court at Marichidor. Uh, and the judge, in an ex parte hearing that afternoon, um, made interim orders. And then, then, basically, they went and served them on the um, uh, developer on site and basically shut them down that afternoon. And so the developer hadn't even, you know, the first that the developer got notice that there was a court was, you know, actually an order from the court. And um, then there would have been a hearing within, if not the next day, within, you know, very quickly. And when you seek that sort of order, typically you have to give an undertaking to pay the cost. If ultimately it shows, you know, it turns out that you weren't entitled to the orders then you have to pay the cost of the other side, you know, so that the fact they had to shut down, the dozers were costing them $10,000 a day over three days, you know, $50,000 in cost, you have to undertake that you will pay that. So all of those things, 
can be basically go into getting some pretty quick orders. Obviously, it's it's rare, um, but it can be done. And typically, like um, as a lawyer involved in practice, you the, the courts notify practitioners of, you know, you can contact the registry even on weekends, even you know on holiday periods. On Christmas Day, there will be a duty judge in the Supreme Court and and, and other courts that can make orders for that court so that if someone needs to contact out of court hours that that can also be done. So, cool? Question. I noticed in step one you talk about where the legislation starts as a bill. Is yes. there any value in, in having an awareness of what's contained in the second reading speech when that goes to Parliament? Not, not really. For normal purposes you can work out most stuff without needing to go and look at you know, second reading speeches or um, the um, the documents that are, the explanatory notes that accompany legislation. They rarely give you anything other than what you get from the words of the legislation themselves. An example being the sections that we looked at for the offence, the, the key offence. It was clear in the legislation that there was an offence. Once we got the um, conditions, we didn't need to go and read the second reading speech or anything, so, and I wouldn't worry about doing that stuff. Um, generally, it should be pretty clear, and if you're into a planning scheme, then, you know, it's not, you don't have to worry about going and looking at second reading speeches or anything like that. Cool? Yeah. 